chapter six. Now, this is once again, like the previous chapter, pretty straightforward. And uh, Moses is reminding them of their conduct and their attitude towards God, that of fearing and loving God. The two go really hand in hand. The great design of God in giving his laws is that the people may fear and obey him, that they may continue in peace and prosperity and be mightily increased. There's a great point in all of this. Christopher Hitchens, the notorious atheist, whenever he was alive, he got throat cancer a few years ago, and he has passed away since. But Christopher Hitchens, he was one of the most known atheists in the whole world. He wrote the book, God is Not Great. And um, he would debate Christians quite often, William Lane Craig and um, I think John Lennox. He debated several. Christopher Hitchens, he was very fond of saying, you know, he would liken God to a, North, a divine North Korean dictator. And he would quite often liken God to that in a way of mockery. He said he's like a dictator. He wants you to fear him and to obey him. Such distorted views of God are very common among those in whom do not actually know or read the Bible. Because we read in a few chapters down the road about how the Lord says, this is what the Lord requires of thee, that you both fear and love him. And it is for our own good that we do this. This isn't just so God can, God could immediately demand all atheists, everyone, everything just completely be in submission totally all the time but he doesn't look at all the freedom that we have it's so much freedom that atheists can blaspheme god a million times a day during their entire lifetimes that's how much freedom that they have that freedom comes from god but he doesn't do that because he's not like a north korean dictator the number one commandment is to love the lord thy god but fear and love go hand in hand. Let me explain. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Notice it's for thy good. Notice what the verse says. Carefully pay attention. This is very important, my friends. What? doth the Lord thy God require of thee. He goes on to tell us what he requires of us. Nothing further, killing Delich comment, nothing further than that thou fearest him to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. The fear of God is to be united with the love of God. For love without fear makes men neglectful. And fear without love makes them servile and desperate. In other words, if you only love God and don't fear him, and I have met people that say that, well, I don't fear God. Well, then you don't truly know God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it's just like a child to a parent. If they only love their parent, but they don't fear them, then they, they'll eventually not respect them. There is this reverential fear that makes you honor those in whom are your caretakers, if you will. For love without fear makes men neglectful. You'll become careless of them and what they have to say and their wisdom and uh, the good things that they can uh, share with you. But fear without love, then you're just a scared servant all the time. And, and according to fear and love must go hand in hand. So the chapter begins, verses 1 through 3, talking about this. And uh, then it goes on, The great commandment of the law, which shall be laid up in their hearts, taught to their children, and affixed as a sign to their hands, heads, doors, and gates, how they are to act when they shall come into the promised land, the chapter goes on, how they shall instruct their children and relate the history to them of God's wonderful acts. Now, there is a verse which quite often draws heated debate among those in whom deny the Trinity, that is, of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost being one God. Well, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We worship one God in Trinity, one God in three persons, 
and Trinity in unity. These three persons are united. But this truth, though visible in the Old Testament by the light of the New, was not explicitly revealed until it came forth in history. When the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, and both the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to represent Him and the church. In the mind of many Jewish people, this verse alone, how the Lord is one, the Lord our God is one, this verse alone to them disqualified the New Testament teaching that Jesus is God and the New Testament teaching of the Trinity, that there is one God existing in three persons. At some times and places, as Jewish synagogues said the Shema together, and when the word one, Echad, was said, they loudly and strongly repeated that one word for several minutes, as if it were a rebuke to Christians who believed in the Trinity. Yet the statement, the Lord is one, certainly does not contradict the truth of the Trinity. In fact, it establishes that truth. Listen to this. The Hebrew word for one is Echad, which speaks most literally of a compound unity. It's a very unique word. Instead of using the Hebrew word yakid, which speaks of an absolute unity or singularity, the very first use of ikad in the Bible is in Genesis 1-5, which it said, so the evening and the morning too, so the evening and morning were the first day. Even here in Genesis 1-5, we see a unity one day with the idea of plurality, made up of evening and morning. Genesis 2.24 uses it caught in saying, The two shall become one flesh. Speaking of a husband and wife. Again, the idea of unity, one flesh, making a plurality, the two. In Exodus 26, the 50 gold clasps are used to hold the curtains together. So the tent would be one. A unity made up of a plurality, the many parts of the tabernacle. These 50 gold clasp, all these parts making one. In Ezekiel 37, once again, the Lord tells Ezekiel to join together two sticks, prophetically representing Ephraim and Judah, into one ikad, into one. Speaking again of a unity, one stick made up of a plurality, the two sticks. There is no way that this word ikad would use right here, for the Lord our God is one. There is no way that in the original Hebrew, that that word has the exclusive idea of an absolute singularity. The idea of one God and three persons fits just fine with the term Echad. In addition, even the name of God in this line suggests the plurality of God. The Hebrew word is Elohim. And grammatically, that word Elohim is a plural word used as if it were singular. The verbs and pronouns used with it are generally in the plural. So astoundingly, even the Trinity can be found in the very verse of the Lord our God is one. It's very amazing. But we also see a Trinity throughout his creation. How it's one universe, but made up of these threes everywhere. Uh, Dr. Ken Hoven does an amazing job explaining this. I recommend everyone watching the full video of this. I'm only going to show a, a little clip of it. But um, if you haven't already seen it, just... Uh, YouTube, where did God come from, Ken Hoven? Because the God of the Bible is not affected by time, space, or matter. If he's, if he's affected by time, space, or matter, he's not God. Time, space, and matter is what we call a continuum. All of them have to come into existence at the same instant. Because if there were matter but no space, where would you put it? If there were matter and space but no time, when would you put it? You cannot have time, space, or matter independently. They have to come into existence simultaneously. God as three persons who have existed for all eternity are all equally powerful, wise, and good, and have always depended on each other. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit existing in perfect harmony as one God. So how can this be? How can you have three things that exist perfectly together as one? Well, here's the thing. If you can understand a tiny bit about how music works, you can understand the basics of the Trinity. So find a piano, pick any white key, and put your thumb on it, then skip a white key and put your index finger on the next one, then skip one more and put your middle finger on the next white key. Now press down your thumb, index finger, and middle finger, and boom, there's a harmonic chord. Three distinct sounds all existing in a perfect harmony. Three things that are also one thing. The threeness and the oneness work perfectly together. This gives us a picture, rather a sound, of what God is like. There is one God, like the one chord, with three persons, like the three notes, all existing in perfect harmony forever.
So unlike the chord, which we just played, which came into being, then ceased to exist, the three persons of the Trinity have always existed. They've always existed in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father has always been Father to the Son. He can't be a Father without a Son. The Son has always been Son to the Father, and they've always been unified by the love of the Spirit. What this means is the most basic fact of all reality is loving relationship. Before there was a world, there was a family, the family of the triune God. So when you get down to the very bottom of things, to the root of all reality, there's love. C.S. Lewis makes this interesting point in Mere Christianity. He writes, All sorts of people are fond of repeating the Christian statement that God is love, but they seem not to notice that the words God is love have no real meaning unless God contains at least two persons. Love is something that one person has for another person. If God was a single person, then before the world was made, he was not love. So the fact that God is perfectly loving requires that God is relational. And the opposite is also true. The fact that God is relational requires that God is perfectly loving. And here's why. If God is triune, we know that God is love because you can't have three people existing for all eternity in harmonious relationship if they aren't perfectly loving. Imagine existing for all eternity with your brothers and sisters or even your friends. Eventually you get into some fights. But the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they don't fight. We know that God is love because God is a trinity. And we know that God is a trinity because God is love. So the trinity is this perfect loving relationship that's always existed, one God and three persons. And because the trinity is one God, the persons work together in everything they do. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, we are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The entire trinity is at work in saving us. So we must name the whole trinity as we're made part of Christ's body through baptism. And it's not just baptism. All throughout the story of Jesus, we see all three persons at work. There's a pattern here. The Father is the source of everything, and he sends the Son to the world in the power of the Spirit. We see this in Jesus' birth. By the Holy Spirit, the Son of God is born to the world. We see this in Jesus' baptism. The Son carries out the mission of the Father in the power of the Spirit. And we see this in Jesus' blessing of his disciples when he ascends. When the Son goes back to the Father, he sends the Spirit to empower us. Did you detect the pattern? Here it is again. The Father is the source and goal of our salvation. Jesus is the way, and the Holy Spirit is the power to get there. Imagine it a bit like this. The Father is the one who says, let there be light, and the Son goes and flips on the light switch, and the Spirit is the electricity that powers the light bulb. The Father is the source, the Son is the way, and the Holy Spirit is the power. Another way of thinking about this is to imagine yourself kneeling and praying the Lord's Prayer. We're praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Now imagine Jesus is standing beside you. And so we begin by praying our Father, and immediately we see that Jesus is helping us to have right relationship with his Father. Now, also imagine it's the Holy Spirit inside you who is giving you the power to pray the prayer Jesus taught us. The Son beside you, the Father above you, the Spirit inside you, all working to give us right relationship with God. All this might seem a bit mysterious and complicated, but the nice thing is that once you start looking for the Trinity, you see it everywhere. For instance, the very words of the Apostles' Creed are shaped by the Trinity. We begin with the Father, the Source, move to the Son, the Way, and end with the Spirit, the Spirit's area of work empowering the Church. The Father above you, Jesus beside you, the Spirit inside you. There you go. There's the Trinity. Also worthy of note is how Jesus, whenever he's being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, those three times, two of those times, he quotes from this very chapter, 6, in the book of Deuteronomy. The first rebuke is found in verse 13 of this chapter, where Satan, he takes Jesus up to the top of the temple, and he says, cast thyself down and the angels will have charge over you so that you can prove that you are the son of God. And Jesus says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The other rebuke is to be found in verse 16 of this chapter, and it's at the final temptation. Obviously, this is a very profound book, but this chapter is especially worthy of note. Verse 16, Jesus quotes to Satan whenever Satan takes him up on an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. It's believed to be in a vision. Shows him all these kingdoms as he's never done to anyone else. This is the greatest temptation I believe that Satan has ever used in such a manner and he used it on Jesus. 
And the devil just says to him, if you'll just bow the knee to me, just bow down to me. And I'll give you all these kingdoms. You'll be ruler over everything that I have. And Jesus, he says, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him only. Chapter 6. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that he may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house, and on thy gates. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, which thou diggedst not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantedst not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God, as ye tempted him in Massa. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to cast out all thine enemies from before thee, as the Lord hath spoken. And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in, to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive, as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness, if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us.